Good morning, my name's Lorene. Welcome to Books at the Bottom of the Stairs. I was just having a facial, which I have done once before in my life. And she does this incredible head massage, arms, hands, sort of collarbone, back of the neck stuff. And it's just so relaxing. I just wanted to pay an extra million dollars so that I could just stay there for the rest of the day and not get off that heated table. It was really wonderful. So what's good about that in terms of books is that I have to review for you next is A Lesson in Vengeance by Victoria Lee. And I hate this book. It's for my book club that's coming up next week. We'll be discussing it. And I'm sure I won't be sitting on the fence about anything. I ended up not reading the entire book. I read about the first 70 odd pages, maybe even 100. And I felt that the main character, Felicity, was so self-absorbed, such a narcissist. She's had something terrible happen to her about, about a year earlier, maybe. And the timeline is, I always think is a little bit weird, but um, something happens to her best friend, Alex. And what I should say is this is taking place at a, um, a girls boarding school called Dalloway, which is for the um, Brainiacs of the Brainiacs High School, not, not uh, college. So we've got engineering, pre-engineering students running around with blueprints. Nobody uses a blueprint anymore. Uh, we've got the literati walking around with, you know, books on their heads and the people that are pre-med with scalpels. Well, I'm exaggerating, but that's the kind of pretensions that were going on. And so Felicity is um, an English amazing person. And uh, she's decided in the previous year that she's going to do some research on the five witches that were the founding daughters, founding mothers of the high school, but the daughters of the witches that had been on trial at the Salem witch trials. So go figure, you know, witches. Uh, this is a bit of a gothic. There's uh, lots of kind of creepy moments in there. She does get the gothic creepy stuff um, pretty nailed down, that's good. And I just, these girls are doing a thesis. Everybody does a thesis and it's like they're trying to reinvent Isaac Newton, you know, they're just so well read and so well educated and so intelligent and it's just pretentious beyond belief, it's snobbish beyond belief, so um, privileged and um, super uber, I just couldn't get into the school life at all. So along comes Alice, who is going to be not Felicity's roommate, but take the room where Felicity's dead best friend had. So now Alice is in the same room that Alex was a year earlier. Uh, Felicity has gone for a year of some kind of mental recalibration stuff. She's doing exactly the opposite of what everybody has advised her. And Alice, she's not just anyone. She's a 17 year old Pulitzer Prize winner. She's an author of great renown and she's there to research her next book and which is gonna be about those witch girls and ugh. anyways, um, it, uh, I just, yeah, uh, that's all I can say. And then I read the last 30 pages because it is for book club and I don't like when people don't read the book. So I thought, well, I'll read 50% of the book. The book ended pretty much the way I expected to end it. The, de the, the details are not what I expected because I didn't have enough information to be able to predict that. But it ended pretty much the way I thought it was going to go. So I don't think I missed anything. You know, somewhere along my reviewing couple of years of doing this, I once gave a book zero and someone chastised me for it that I should at least give credit for the writing of it. So, okay, this is a one. It's going to be, it's going to appeal to people who just don't care what their characters are or they like the school the school setting and they like a, a mean person group and uh, yeah I don't, I don't know who's gonna like this book would we be friends I don't know but I just feel really sorry for the paper it was printed on so completely the opposite is etiquette and espionage 
which is by Gail Carriger. Now this is a completely different protagonist, 14 year old girl who is being sent to finishing school and it's steampunk and the school is, takes place in uh, th three co-joined dirigibles. You know, those Zeppelin airships that are on helium and so on, they need steam to be powered. And so we've got the these boiler steam rooms in the bottom and we've got the um, up top is the schools and the teachers areas and and um, sort of gymnastic gymnasium kind of space on the back end and uh, there is a vampire who's one of the professors there's a werewolf who's one of the uh, auxiliary teachers there are uh, there are other supernatural beings that we don't encounter all of them there are pirates there is a prototype of some kind of steampunk mechanization that has to do with communications that's missing. Our main character is Sarfanina, and she goes to this boarding school somewhat reluctantly because she doesn't really want to be finished. She's a tomboy. She's sort of a, on the edge of being um, really interested in mechanics, but she doesn't have any opportunities. And um, she so she thinks she's going to a place where she has to learn curtsying and everything. This is a finishing school for people who are going to be trained to be avengers, poisoners, assassins, just people, women in particular, who will be placed in society that they will be able to facilitate, um, um, I guess, the equivalent of what we, we all think the CIA does. So she loves it. She's having a great old time. And so it's about the mystery around the prototype and a few other things that are happening. And she's really having fun. This is this is a book that's completely the opposite. It, they're, it's a fun character. It's a fun group of secondary characters. The, the uh, vampire teacher is a hoot. I, I really like it. So I think there's four in the series and I did um, in a moment of madness. They're all waiting for me. I'm going to just binge read and, uh, and see what... <laughs> lunch time <laughs> and there's part of my lunch I couldn't find any flowers today and I thought well the bananas are great okay the other book uh, that was for my other uh, book club The Rush of Wings by Laura E. Weymouth is a fairy tale retelling and it is this fairy tale of I think it was the seven princes or the seven swan brothers or something along those lines and their sister where they're all cursed. She's cursed to be silent whenever her brothers are in swan form and she needs to get the nettles and clean the nettles so that she can knit with them in order to make shirts for the brothers and that will break the curse. They will no longer be swans, they will be humans but she can't talk while they're in swan shapes, so she can't get any help. And if she does get help, she's, she's in trouble anyhow. So the curse is set by an evil being. And um, what's happening in this book, that's the story arc. So, you know, get cursed, fix the curse, get rid of the evil person kind of arc. That hasn't changed at all in this storytelling. What's changed, I think, is the setting and the time um, of that it's happening it seems to be kind of um, that moment in Scottish history where they were trying to be independent. They mentioned the Battle of Culloden. And um, so it's that moment where they are sort of under British rule, but might be able to bring themselves out of it, that kind of battle period. And um, yet we've got all these supernatural beings that are in place and there's magic. And our main, um, character Rowena is um, she has magical powers but her mother hasn't let her learn about them because she's got a temper and her mother fears that Rowena's temper is going to put her on the dark side of the magical spectrum. Well that just all comes to uh, a bad end in a, in a sense and Rowena is left to struggle with the knowledge herself and learn things on her own and so it's a real stumbling path and there is a king, not a king, I'm sorry, he's a prince He's like a really bad prince. He's he's not the evil character that kicks things off, but he sure helps. Um, so she's got to break the curse, and there's lots of tribulations on that pathway, not just the knitting of, net, of nettles, but um, 
her brothers, when they become human, have to try and find a way to feed themselves. And so they're off on a bunch of adventures themselves that are not particularly um, pleasant. So yeah, there's quite a lot of action. It was very action packed. Uh, again, this is a book that in the first 70 pages, because I don't, I don't love that particular story tale, fairy tale, uh, I had trouble buying in initially because I kept thinking, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, what's, what are you bringing to the table that's different? Well, once we get to the second half of the book where we meet Tor, the, um, the, the evil prince, then the book really starts to rock and we really have some very interesting moral dilemmas about about using power and about um, friends, making friendships with beings that are considered to be evil. There's an evil being that also has to look deep into their um, their evil self. Like, do they have to be evil all the time? So yeah, there's quite a lot of interesting questions in this and it, it clips along. The first half isn't boring. It's just that for me, it wasn't an engaging fairy tale. I think if, if uh, if you just love your fairy tales regardless, you're going to love the whole book. But uh, yeah, so I thought it was a pretty good one. And we'll be discussing it more next week with my book club. And I'll be interested to hear what they bring forward. Because that's one of the beauties of a book club is quite often something is brought forward that is not... Um, it, like it's just not on your own radar because you're coming at it from a different, a different direction. So. Okay, the last book I read was... is... Thomas King, Deep House. This is the sixth in his Dreadful Water Mystery series. It's quite a bit calmer than the previous one. In the previous one, his girlfriend Claire and his possible daughter Ivory are potential victims of this serial killer. So there's, it, it's much more intense. It's a much more complicated mystery. Here we've got a body that's been discovered in a canyon and this body has been uh, reported, they, he has stolen a van and the van theft has been reported and he has turned up in this canyon dead. So this is the investigation and it's connected back to the company where the van was stolen from, which is a paint company, chemical paints kind of thing. And the scientist that is missing, we discover a little bit further on, is the developer of uh, paint that allows for solar power. So this would be a great application in um, poor neighborhoods and so on, where solar power could be developed without all the, you know, all the infrastructure it could just be on painted onto boards and you could get solar resources going. But it also would be great for the military. So uh, the do-good side of the chemical world and the for-profit side of the chemical world are clashing over this and dreadful water is in the middle of it and needs to solve where is the missing scientist why is that body there and then of course he's got his own interpersonal problems which have to do with Claire being somewhat ambivalent about their relationship all of a sudden Ivory not being 100% keen on her dad anymore and a cat that just keeps coming and going. There's lots of other things that happen. The secondary characters are pretty interesting. He references the uh, COVID pandemic very clearly. And there's a lot of businesses that are kind of going up in smoke or are making very creative uh, twists around to stay in business. So uh, you still get quite a good sense of what the community is like and dealing with. And, and really Thomas King, uh, so far, so far, I haven't come across anything that I dislike. There are some things, you know, I'm a little more lukewarm than others, but honestly, he just never disappoints me. So for those who really like um, his his series, if you haven't started the series before, I, you know, I recommend it. It starts off with the one called Dreadful Water. And um, yeah, I really, I think it's quite a charming series. You just, you're not... What is it? Like you're just not having dead bodies all over the place and the trail of mystery is not so oblique that you think to yourself, are we even in a mystery? Like what happened to the clues? So the other thing that's going on, um, Rick from the website that I cannot remember, I think it's called Rick Reads Books, but I'm not positive. I'm going to link it below. He did that spin-off 
a couple of weeks back where he spun the dial and numbers 17 and 20 came up and you were to pull those books from your reading list and read those books before the next time he spin. So for me, the minted was number 17, which I did Mad Minutes on earlier. And the other one was my husband, Simon, which is from the British, um, British Women's Writers Library, I believe that's, I've got, I've got that all wrong. And so I'll link that below too, but I've passed it on to Cheryl because Cheryl and I are gonna do another book, switch it up and we'll have a discussion on those two books. So that's coming probably in July, I think. Um, I have a few library books that I have yet to finish, but what I'm gonna start concentrating on is the Newberry Challenge that uh, I'm going to do in June. And for those of you who'd like to tag along with me, it's nothing particularly challenging. What I'm going to recommend you do is go to the Newberry uh, Awards from previous years, and I will link that eventually in the doobly-doo below. Um, for those of you who get to the videos quickly, uh, quite often there isn't in any information below because in order to do that, I have to use the computer. I don't know why the iPad won't link it in, but it'll only let me link in one or two things. I have to go to the computer and, and do a more thorough job. So there is a bit of a lag for those of you who are quick on the, on the watching front. Um, so I will link the list of Newberry winners from previous years. It's been going on since the uh, 1920s or something like that. Mildred Taylor, who was a wonderful author for uh, black children, she's been a, a winner. And um, Kate DiCamillo has been a winner. Oh, there's Gregory, Pe not Gregory Peck. <laughs> Richard Peck, a lot of really well-known authors have won this award. And I think from my reading of it over the years, there has yet to be a book where I have thought to myself, why did that win? Now, I also read the short list and sometimes I think, oh, I would have chosen that one. But usually all four or five books are really top-notch. And um, I don't read enough to know whether there should be something that's not on the short list that should have been included. But I've, I'm always very, very satisfied. So what I'm gonna suggest you do is pick um, a year prior to, including 2005 and before, and that gives us about a 20 year range to look back on those books. And the question to keep your eyes peeled for and your brains peeled for is, is there something really unexpected or something really exciting that comes out of that group of books. You don't have to read all of them. You can read just the winner. You can read just the short list or just read the ones that you haven't read recently. And, or you can just watch along. And so I'm, gonna, I'm hoping that in the comments, people will bring forward something that was unexpected for them out of those Newberry winners. So we'll do that in June and I'll be a little more clear uh, probably the the week before June. But if you are like me and likes to go to the library and just put books on hold, which I've already done, uh, you can do that now. So, um, or, in, you know, <laughs> this week. So I think that's it for me. Um, I hope you liked my bananas. It was the only yellow thing I could find or bright thing. And yeah, I guess, I guess that's everything. I hope all your reading dreams and adventures continue to come true. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.